Welcome, everybody. We are ready to launch our uh, third Universal Design for Learning um, IRN Hangout. And tonight we are bringing you a wonderful presentation. We're calling it Focusing on the R in IRN, and that is a look at UDL research. My name is Sue Harden, and I am the Professional Development uh, Coordinator for the UDL IRN, and I'm delighted to have a wonderful group here with me this evening. Um, I'm going to first introduce you to the webinar, and then I'll let our presenters uh, introduce themselves. So um, let me go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my screen and ha show uh, our PowerPoint presentation here. Okay, let me back up to the very beginning. And here we go. So we are focusing on the R and IRN, a look at UDL research. And we have our research committee uh, with us this evening and a few special guests. So the way that our webinar is uh, structured is that we will spend the first 20 minutes talking about the issues uh, related to UDL research and then we'll spend the second 20 minutes and this says uh, potential solutions but really what we're going to talk about in this 20 minutes are some future directions for UDL IRN research and then the last 20 minutes will be a chance to talk amongst ourselves um, with our Twitter folks on Twitter um, and ask questions and have a conversation about the, pro the problem posed and the future directions that we're discussing. Um, so if you are, so definitely bring your questions and your thoughts tonight. The Hangout is only as good as our participants, so we do expect and hope for you to be active participants in this session, asking questions, tweet them, um, share them, and that's really what makes this uh, hangout so um, wonderful in terms of getting information and going deep into the questions and the solutions. For those of you who are viewing via YouTube, welcome. We're going to use the hashtag UDLIRN tonight. This will be a great place for you to uh, share your comments, pose some questions. We'll be coming to those questions at each 20-minute break. Um, and, of course, the last 20 minutes will be focused primarily on questions and answers. If you're viewing it, um, you can see us at uh, YouTube on our, our Gmail account. Um, so if you go to Google Plus and you look for UDL IRN, you'll find our site. Uh, it will be archived at um, on YouTube as well. So if you miss tonight's Hangout, feel free to catch us uh, the recording on YouTube. And then just a quick plug for those of you who may not know, we are uh, getting organized for our UDL IRN Summit 2016. This will be our third summit. This year we will be heading to uh, Towson University in Maryland. It is March 16th and 17th, and registration is open. So if you're interested in checking out the summit, head to UDL dash irn.org and registration. Uh, you'll find the registration button there front and center on page one. It looks to be an excellent summit. We are so excited with the number of proposals we, re we have received. Um, it's going to be all the folks who are really the leaders in UDL out talking about UDL um, and uh, leaders in terms of implementation and research and really it's a place to go to kind of get up to date on what's the latest and greatest um, in UDL uh, philosophy and implementation. Uh, just a quick reminder that UDL chat happens every first and third Wednesday of the month. Um, so join us at uh, hashtag UDL chat. And it's another great way to connect with those who are interested in the topic and wanting to share resources, information, um, and updates on their progress in UDL implementation and research. All right, so that is the end of the commercial. We're going to bring you to our team. So I'm going to ask each of you, pardon me, that or thank you shouldn't have been in there quite yet, <laughs> to introduce yourselves. Um, so if uh, Jim wants to start, that'd be great. Sure, I'm gonna, and, and I'm, I'm doing a shout out to our UDL crusader, Brian Dean, who's also one of Sue's colleagues. And I, Brian, I, I hope you like the hat, Brian. <laughs> but I, I'm Jim Gardner from the University of Oklahoma. Next. I'm Elisa Lowry from University of Southern Mississippi. 
Hi, Sean Smith from the University of Kansas. Welcome, everybody. And Hi, this is uh, Kavita Rao from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And Minog also from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Uh, this is Kavita uh, Indar. I'm from the University of Kansas. I'm Richard Carter from the University of Kansas. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us tonight. And Jim, I think you have the start of uh, the presentation. So and, go ahead. Yeah, and I think, Sue, um, I, I am unable to see your screen for whatever technical reason it's happened. So I'm going to have the good faith that we'll be following along and we're at the agenda phase of the slide. And so Sue's welcomed us. Um, we're we're going to separate things maybe in a little different time frame than we originally talked about the 2020. Those of you who are fans of This American Life, often they do things in acts. And so we're going to have three acts. We're going to talk about research perspectives. Then we're going to move to sharing some compelling questions and some issues. And then um, at that point, we'll have discussion and then continue the discussion looking into the future. So our next slide, or we're starting at Act 1 for research perspectives. And if we move to the next one, kind of uh, let's start out with a New Yorker cartoon. Uh, buyer beware. Um, just kind of the joke that I think we're going to be sharing multiple perspectives and um, anyone is free to jump in and share their perspective. There are no right or wrong um, ways of looking at things. We really encourage open discussion and, and communication. So on our next slide, those of you who may be fans with uh, Dancing with the Stars or other or of ice skating, probably you have seen, have seen, have seen, have seen situations where you have the same Ah, now I can see it. Super. Same individuals in the same place and context, not necessarily judging things 100% precisely. And we're still at an early phase in the paradigm of thinking about universal design for learning because if we step back and we look at the guidelines, Sue? Everyone else, do we have the uh, one more? There we go. Thank you. Oh. Um, our guidelines, we're going to see that if we look at the checkpoints of universal design, we actually have 31 different checkpoints that we have to address. Um, and when we're working with those, the question comes up is, is how do we think of UDL as a framework? And right now, one of the perspectives that seems to be shared by most is, is UDL is a framework that has an evidence base for all the checkpoints. If we can move to the next slide. So if we were to go to the National Center for Universal Design for Learning, for example, we would discover that we can click on links and we can identify the evidence base for any one of the individual checkpoints. If we move to our next slide, John Hattie has also gone in and has compiled a variety of meta-analytic analytic research studies that also provide us evidence of the effect of a variety of the individual checkpoints. So now we have these, these two sets of data that we can look to in terms of being able to establish the research base for individual checkpoints. But we have to return to this notion of UDL as a framework. Next slide. And if we think about these 31 different checkpoints, plus some of the principal other factors of UDL, 
such as we build in these variations of flexibility for option strategies. We have different type tools. We know that student interests vary and the context could be math, could be science, could be written language. And the fact that we have to address multiple elements of learner variability, we really do have this challenge at one point is what constitutes UDL if we wanted to say it really is effective in our next slide. And so if we were thinking purely of stakeholders or doing research, we would certainly want to be able to say that universal design for learning as an independent learning is going to have some clear learning outcomes in the students. But the challenge becomes, are we able as a field to still uniformly say we know UDL if we would see it, and would we uniformly agree if it's UDL? So there are some other sources of information on UDL. Next slide. Um, there's a topical issue in Learning Disabilities Quarterly, uh, Peggy King Sears put together with their series of uh, different articles discussing the research evidence or ways of looking at UDL. And then Rao, Oak, and Bryant in the 2014 issue of Remedial and Special Education um, put together a article that examined some of the evidence-based studies that were using UDL as an intervention. And so now we're going to turn the floor over to uh, Kavita and, and her colleague, um, Ms. Oak, to share some of their information from their study. OK, thank you. Um, I'm assuming you can all hear us. Um, great. So um, Min is here with me today. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the study that we um, got published in RAISE last year. You can go on to the next slide. OK, thank you. I'm going to look at my notes because the slides are really small on my screen. Um, so I just want to go back to the seeds of where the study came from. In 2011, we had a new group of doctoral students in um, my department, in my special ed department. And the students were um, studying EBPs and the criteria for establishing evidence-based practices. And they, we were, they were also taking a seminar on UDL from me. And a lot of questions kept coming up about, is UDL an evidence-based practice? And we talked at length in this class about how UDL is not actually just a practice, but it's the framework that can be applied to many practices. So because of these discussions, um, the questions keep coming up about, well, is UDL applied in certain particular ways to practices? So we decided to look at the literature and see how people were actually applying UDL. Um, next slide. So in late 2011, early 2012, um, Min, Brian Bryant, and I did, did a very comprehensive search of the databases looking for articles that um, were referencing universal design. And we looked for articles that mentioned universal design for learning, universal instructional design, and or universal design of instructions. And we were very excited that we found 200 articles when we did this search. Um, so we thought, wow, there's go we're going to find some really amazing ways that people are applying UDL. After we read the abstracts of all of those articles systematically, we realized that a large number of them were conceptual and descriptive. Um, so they were talking about why universal design is a good thing to use in curriculum, but many, many of those articles didn't actually take it the next step in to what to actually do with the guidelines. So we came up with the research questions of looking for studies of, of how people have used UDL and looking at the characteristics of those studies. And we also wanted to go a little bit deeper and look at how UDL was operationalized and actually applied by the researchers. So as Jim said, we wanted to start looking at down at the guideline and checkpoint level, what are people doing with UDL? Uh, next slide. So, after look, reading the 200 abstracts, we realized we really needed a lay of the land because the articles were so varied and so wide-ranging. So you'll see our inclusion criteria up there. We decided to look for a studies that had any type of qualitative or quantitative design. We decided to look at both post-secondary and K-12 through just to see what's going on in, in different environments. And we looked for studies referencing any of those three UD models that we have up there on the screen. 
we were actually really surprised that when we applied those inclusion criteria, only 13 studies actually met the criteria in 2012 for research studies. Eight of those were in K-12 settings and five in post-secondary settings. Um, next slide. And I won't go into all the results. You can read that in our paper in RAISE. But in essence, what we discovered in those 13 articles that we looked, we coded very, very carefully uh, in a very detailed way, we found that the ways that researchers describe their use of UDL is, com is very varied. There is no um, one way in which UDL is uh, used, applied, or even described in the various studies that we saw. Um, we also notice that some researchers talk about uh, UDL in the introduction of their paper and they will talk about using the three principles or the the guidelines of the other two models that we talked about but then when they talk about their intervention they don't actually say what components of their intervention um, actually met any of those guidelines. Um, we did find a few studies in that set of 13 where that happened but by and large people talked about using UDL but didn't make those links. Um, next slide. Okay, I can't see if the next slide is up. I think the next slide is up. Um, so the the rec we have a section of recommendations in that article, and three of the major ones that we came up with was that in order to actually establish the efficacy of UDL as a framework, we really need to have some standards for operationalizing the guidelines. People need to start saying which guidelines and um, even which checkpoints they're using, and going and being more specific than that, actually linking those guidelines and checkpo checkpoints to components of their intervention. Many people did kind of package interventions where many things were going on, and it would have been good to know what things people set were connecting to UDL and those intervention packages. And then the third bullet point, I think, is the most important. One of the things that happened in many of the studies where people talked about UDL in the introduction, um, they talked about why it's a good framework to use, and then they might have mentioned it um, in the process of their intervention. But often in the discussion, when they talked about the outcomes and the efficacy of the practices they were doing, they wouldn't link um, the practices to UDL. So it's hard to know if it's the UDL part of the practice that was effective or the practice in general. So we really looked at being very clear about the links between UDL at the intervention level and at the outcome level. Um, next slide. So Min is going to talk about an updated study that we've done uh, very recently. So uh, for our second review paper, we update to the first review, but we only focus on UDL and also K-12 settings. So the purpose of review was to analyze the studies, investigating the impact of UDL-based uh, research and uh, on the academic and social outcomes for pre-K through 12th grade students. So we analyzed how UDL principles were applied to the interventions and also examined the efficacy of the UDL-based interventions. And we found five more uh, studies after our first review. So we reviewed the total 13 studies for this paper. So next slide. So the result of this review suggests that, okay, overall, the UDL-based interventions have potentials to increase student engagement and curriculum access for students with disabilities and improve their academic and social outcomes. However, we found the efficacy of the UDL-based interventions varied uh, constantly. We calculate the effect size within and across the studies, and we found uh, various effect size and magnitude uh, from the small to large. And also there was a variance uh, in how researchers made the connection uh, between the UDL principles and the components of their interventions. But the good thing is new studies uh, have started to find, uh, make a more specific connections, and they even made a connection with the specific UDL checkpoints. Next slide. Okay, and this is our final slide. I just want to mention the innovation configuration that I know Sean was one of the co-authors on. Um, this came out in 2014, and it's posted at the Cedar Center. The quote on the top of that slide is something that I think is really important for us as UDL researchers to consider. Um, what we really need to start looking at is how you, um, UDL can be used within evidence space and effective practices that we already know to work. And I think going forward um, as UDL researchers, I think that's what's going to be important for us to establish, um, and based on the two studies that we just discussed, um, we're really looking at how, where does UDL play a role within practices that we know already work uh, for students and what components of those UDL, of the UDL use is um, making the learning more barrier free and increasing the outcomes for students. And next slide, I think that's it for us. <laughs> I, I'm not sure if we're going to do questions at the end, Sue. 
Sue, we have some questions off of Twitter if I want to pop. Do you want me to pop on or not? Um, sure, Sean. Or yeah, what do you say, Sue? I'm sorry. Let's go ahead, Sean, and take a few questions that um, have popped up, and then we'll continue on. That's great. Well, I'll just offer one is that uh, with the 31 checkpoints, the fact that that really provides a challenge for research, uh, do we know when we do we know it when we see it? Is is a kind of the generic question out there? Anyone want to jump in? I'll jump in on that one. Um, I do a lot with um, checkpoints and lesson planning in my teacher preparation courses. And I think many of those checkpoints, we can kind of guess which checkpoints people are using. But I feel like the UDL framework is almost a menu of options where people can choose five or six different checkpoints and apply it to instruction. So it is helpful. I think you can sometimes guess what people are trying to do. But it's also helpful to be explicit, whether you're a teacher making a lesson or a researcher making an intervention, how you're combining, what permutation and combination of checkpoints are you using. And I'll actually try to answer that here in just a moment with a few slides that we have uh, listed in just a minute. So I'll wait for some additional questions on the uh, the Twitter feed. Uh, feel free to keep throwing them out there, folks. We'll we'll get to them here as we go along. All right. Well, thank you, Sean. Let's go ahead and continue on then, and then um, as they pop in, you're welcome to interrupt Sean at any time. All right. Who's next? And if we look at the next slide, some additional research perspectives. Sean's going to talk about UDL and online learning. And then Elisa will follow him and talk about UDL in individuals with intellectual disabilities. Well, sure. Uh, in a way, to follow what Kavita was sharing and her uh, colleague there, Min, uh, that. Uh, there's, uh, there's a number of a number of issues, and, and so Jamie and I, uh, Jamie Basham is a colleague here at the University of Kansas, and a colleague with the Center on Online Learning and Students with Disabilities, and I uh, actually considered the fact that blended and fully online learning uses a lot of stable content, um, lessons that individuals go through uh, as part of either the blended, flipped, supported learning, or potentially fully online, where they're getting into a vendor excuse me, getting into a lesson that in many instances is developed by a vendor that's affiliated with the district, um, where the lessons are uh, basically what the individual walks through for their online experience. And so beyond the accessibility question, which would be more potentially compliant to 503 standards um, and other elements that deal with physical and sensory access, we were looking at it from more of a learning access. And that's very simplistic. But within that area, we decided well, how would it align with the critical elements of universal design for learning, particularly, of course, the principles, the guidelines, and the checkpoints. And in so doing, part of the exercise was, and, and in a way, it could be as you were sharing about the literature, it was very much kind of our experience as well. So from a framework perspective, how would we potentially examine it? How would we look to measure elements of the guidelines and the checkpoints? And so we teased through. Uh, in trying to determine if we were trying to use some sort of scale instrument tool, what would it look like if we were to, to determine whether or not a guideline was being met or a checkpoint under that guideline was being met? Well, anyways, if you want to turn to the next slide there, uh, Sue, what we determined was that we were going to utilize, um, based on the guidelines and the various checkpoints and, of course, the three principles, we're going to develop a series of questions. And those questions were elements of is it there or not? Of course, yes, no. But then if it is there, well, wait, let's get deeper. And then the deeper, the deepness, the depth, definitely was along the lines of guidelines and checkpoints. And so the uh, skinny of it is, and the, the manuscript that was posted up there a moment ago is, is where you can get into more detail. Actually, Jamie and I have published another piece on this in Teaching Exceptional Children. Um, but the, the, the skinny of it is that uh, our focus uh, is that the instrument allows for uh, a very initial review, but if UDL, if we're finding elements of UDL are present, the guidelines are being met, checkpoints within the guidelines are being met based on the questions we're answer, asking, uh, the tool actually expands. We're using skip logic. And so we did with this, and of course the questions themselves start off with anywhere from 36 to well over 200 that an individual could use to determine whether or not this content, and again we focused on online learning, this static content, aligns with the principles, guidelines, and elements, excuse me, checkpoints of universal design for learning. What you have in front of you is a visual from uh, an examination of a vendor. And from that, you'll see that we looked at, of course, the principle. We looked at 
three of the guidelines uh, that, that fall, excuse me, the checkpoints that fall into there. And you'll see there that the element there is a lot of gray, meaning there's a lot of opportunity for a uh, potential score out of 36 that was not met. Uh, once you go to the, uh, I think we have one more slide there, Sue. Uh, and I'm giving a very, very brief overview here. But for example, underneath the provide options for perception, the checkpoints there, we asked questions, itemized to those. And from that, we scored. And we scored a series of lessons. Uh, we did random sampling in order to do this. Uh, and then we made some determinations from that scoring. And we did this across a number of different vendors. Uh, we're actually, when the online center, uh, Center of Online Learning and Students with Disabilities, we'll have this report out, oh gosh, probably now uh, in late November, that examines all six vendors that we examined, uh, as well as the tool and an understanding of how the tool can be used. Again, our effort here wasn't so much, yes, it was to look at blended and fully online learning, but it was also trying to understand how we begin to measure UDL. And it was a try. Uh, the instrument itself, we have determined it's reliable and, and valid based on the measures that would be appropriate for that. And it's an initial effort. And again, that manuscript that Jim uh, referenced earlier would be uh, where you can find out a little bit more on a, a one vendor overview. Um, I, I'll, I'll allow Lisa to jump in. Just wanted to offer kind of a, a, an effort in an attempt to measure whether or not UDL is present. And this one was with static online lessons. All right, any questions for Sean before I get started? Sean, there are a few on the Twitter feed, so if you don't mind, I'll just pose them. Um, they, they're all kind of around the same idea that um, if the UDL uh, checkpoints are a menu of choices, how do we know then what the minimum requirements are in order to say, yes, this uh, practice, this implementation falls within UDL guidelines? It, have we thought about that? Well, I could. I, I'll simply answer it in our effort. In our effort, it was it was a struggle, and uh, we went through very. We tried to go very very thoroughly in what options would consider, and we used a lot, of course, what the checkpoints are, but also what some of the alignment, what some of the background to those checkpoints are, based on a lot of the literature that uh, CAST has utilized initially in developing uh, the overall framework. Um, again, that, that is a challenge, and I'm not going to say that we, 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 we accomplished it entirely um, because you're right, there's a lot of variability in what those checkpoints can be uh, in terms of what they would actually look like in an attempt. Any other questions? I saw the comment on Ditch the Desk. I have seen that, but I haven't seen any study, any um, research study of that. So I've heard things, but I haven't actually seen anything in print that was an empirical study. Um, I see that question on um, Twitter, and there was the the comment about publishing UDL research interventions at, at well, I, I prefer to call it UDL framework. Um, at, that definitely is difficult to publish outside of special education. Um, because people don't understand uh, that it is really a, a general education application. So um, I, I totally get that. Are you ready for me to move on, Sue, to my Yeah, we are. <laughs> and then we'll take the rest of the um, Twitter questions then at, at our break. So you go right ahead. I'll bring your next slide up. and. Well, I lose the contest tonight of the most attractive slides. I have no beautiful graphics. I have nothing. It's just straightforward text. That's not me. One more. There you go. So I know, um, nope, too far, too far, too, there you go. <laughs> just right. We'll play Goldilocks. Um, so for me, my lens that I look at um, Universal Design for Learning um, uh, with when I look at the framework, I'm really specifically looking. I'm a I'm a person who really uh, looks at individuals with significant disabilities and how to best meet their needs in educational settings and particularly in inclusive settings. And um, I, for me, universal design for learning as a, a teaching framework has always made just incredibly good sense, and I don't see why others don't see that. However, when we start digging around in the research. Um, 
we don't see that. <laughs> so I guess that's the easiest way to say that. Um, so when we look at the definition, certainly, certainly we're in there. Kids with significant disabilities certainly fit in the all, but we go back to that idea of where really are where are we really in the field in inclusive practices and so where are we educationally. You can go to the next slide. So this summer I was charged with um, developing or actually putting together a little bit of a, a lit review for AAIDD as they were making their next um, 10 years uh, of goals for individuals with intellectual disabilities. This is something that I've, I've looked at for quite a while and again I am guilty, very guilty of putting out more positiony pieces without empirical studies. So I'm changing my own practice based on on that as well. Um, I can honestly say. So we have tons of pieces um, talking about what a wonderful thing UDL is and how applicable it could be for students with intellectual disabilities. How much promise it holds for students with intellectual disabilities. You can go over the last 15 years and find lots of of um, position pieces that, uh, or as, as our earlier presenters were saying, in their introduction they might talk, uh, an author might talk about, well this is, you know, this is going to be really applicable to what we're doing. They might even call out the three principles, um, but when you really look at application, uh, there's a couple of things when you, that you find when you start looking specifically for learners with intellectual disabilities. Um, one of those, and I'm not that's so tiny and my eyes are so old, Sue, I, I don't even know where we are. So if you, I'm on 29 now. So if you, um, if you look at the direct study that actually talks about students with intellectual disabilities, it, it, is, it is pitifully absent in the research. I don't know how else to say that. Um, it's, it's, it's difficult enough, as all of our earlier presenters have talked about, um, to find empirical study that actually looks at the application of the UDL framework, whether it be specific components of the framework or whether it be um, an overall implementation of the framework. When you get down to that participants list and you actually start looking at who was included in the application in this classroom, um, individuals with particularly moderate to severe intellectual disabilities almost are non-existent in empirical study. Um, and as I said, I'm trying to change that in my own practice and just a, a a story of current research, we've been recruiting um, for, uh, there are four of us all over the United States that have been recruiting for um, the past three months for teachers in inclusive classrooms that have been implementing UDL for uh, the UDL framework for a year that have at least one student with significant disabilities in their classroom and so far we have zero there, it, lots of people say they're doing that, but when it comes down to actually talking to a teacher and identifying criteria, it it's not there in the in the um, way that we would like to see it to actually be able to study it. It makes it very difficult. So we actually, I, I got approval today to expand that to moderate to um, severe intellectual disabilities so that we could broaden our horizons and see what we can pick up um, in terms of really looking at those experiences that teachers have. But back to published research, um, there are a few studies, not nearly enough, that really show us um, what's happening with students with intellectual disabilities when an inclusive classroom is using a UDL framework. If we go to the slide 30, there are a couple of studies um, that talk about universal design for learning in a special education or segregated setting which brings its own set of concerns um, in that uh, universal design for learning is intended theoretically to be universal design for learning for all, right? We're designing the universe of a classroom and so when we use those principles, certainly applying principles and checkpoints, this is one of the questions at hand, is if we apply those principles and checkpoints in a segregated setting where we're really supposed to be doing more individualized instruction, is that still UDL? Um, 
because really UDL is more generalized instruction, right? So, you know, these are questions that the field has to answer. Someone really has to look at that and say yes or no. And I'm, like I said, throwing my my um, work that way these days because it, it really does need to be answered as we move forward. Um, what else do I have here? So I have some next steps. Um, these are the recommendations that uh, we put for, or I put forward at, at AAIDD. Certainly that became one of their 10-year goals for individuals with intellectual disability, primarily that we need more information. We need um, empirical information. We need uh, study that really, as, as the earlier presenters were saying, well, people need to, when they, after they do their introduction, they need to actually include what components of their intervention um, uh, relate to universal design for learning. I would say also in their participant list, they need to include who's involved, like who, who are these people and, and what kinds of background and training um, do the teachers have and all those kinds of things that we want to know so that we can really do some comprehensive examinations of um, the UDL framework in application in classrooms. Um, so I, as I'm prone to do, right guys, I just threw this one big slide together of all these millions of questions that bounce around my brain. <laughs> and um, I, I leave it to you guys to give me the solutions because <laughs> these, are, these are questions that, you know, we banter around but also um, kind of I go to sleep at night thinking about. and. Uh, because I, you know, I guess because I'm on my students, I threw in my references, sorry. <laughs> but that's really it for me. Um, I don't, where are we, Sue, on slides? Are you on my questions? That's where I'd like you to stop. <laughs> I am, Elise. So okay. we're right on your questions, one through five, and okay. everyone can see those right now. Because I do like the earlier question on Twitter. It's really hard, I think, and especially when you know, people like me come up from it at a very, um, you know, I am an advocate for individuals with intellectual disabilities learning in inclusive settings, and so I come at it from a very special ed place. That doesn't mean that I own it as a special ed framework, if that makes any sense at all. And so we have to somehow deal with those uh, questions three and four um, in that shift and so far I'm not wonderfully successful. However, I will say we have a current study going on with 82 student teachers here at the university um, including secondary, all elementary ed student teachers and um, our special education student teachers shifting their planning to universal design for learning planning and it's got some real applied components. So I'm going to be exhausted in December in terms of coding video teaching exemplars as well as their written exemplars but I'm looking forward to seeing how that shifts any mindset that doesn't include individuals necessarily with intellectual disabilities which is my other big angst. So, Alicia, <laughs> so, Alicia yeah. there seems to be, I mean, you just seem to mention that you're definitely doing some additional research and it sounds like you are using yeah. some sort of uh, tool or at least uh, to be able to measure what you're observing. Uh, question out there on the Hangout, a couple questions. One is are mm -hmm. others out there, what lessons are being learned in doing UDL research as well as what other potential measures are out there? I know Jim uh, you've been involved with one with Jamie and myself uh, for well, observation for some of the research. And of course there was desk dicting and, and a conversation about whether or not uh, folks are uh, considering uh, ditching their desk in terms of some of their redesign for the classroom. And we're using, we did a conversion of the UDL checklist that's offered by uh, CAST. It's like a self-evaluation tool. So we took that checklist and we're going to have, we're going to evaluate uh, teachers here have to, student teacher candidates have to videotape themselves teaching. And so we're going to code their video using that checklist is one of the things we're going to do. One of the things. Merry Christmas. That's what I'm going to be doing. <laughs> All right, so we're going to stop there. That is our content for the evening. Am I right, Jim? Did, did we make it through the slide deck? For this Essentially, y yes, we have. And what I'm going to ask you to do, I think now we're moving in to the point where we're going to have some compelling questions. And, of course, 
Um, as, as always, there's a little bug and a quirk. And if we can go to the slide that says compelling issues and questions, I'll stop talking and let you post that up there. And there we go, Jim. You are up and and here it is for everyone to see. Because I know, and I'm not sure how this works, if now that I'm talking, my face is up there. Or can everyone see the uh, the slide? I with can the see thing? The yeah, yeah, everyone can see the slide. And you can, too, if you click on it in the bottom yeah. menu. Yeah. Yes, OK. Because okay. I'm not a big Hangout person. Now I'm up there. So a lot of, of well, everyone in one context uh, tonight, uh, even some of the people on the Twitter feed and, and other folks, hang on here, um, th these are some of the compelling issues and questions that we thought would be uh, of interest to us to talk about. And, and we can discuss these and think about them uh, in, in no particular order. They're they're not in any significance because I th uh, significant order because I think all of us depending on the context and how we're trying to think about UDL probably have have thought about one or more of these issues so uh, I think we should open it up to the floor um, to see uh, what what folks think about some of these issues and questions And I, I'm going to um, see if anyone on our Hangout has uh, a question or response or a comment to these issues, and then we will open it up next to uh, our Twitter feed. So this is opened up to everybody who's on the Hangout who'd like to make any, com any additional comments about this before we move to the Twitter feed. Okay, I don't see anybody jumping, but I, I guess I would like to just pose that I'm very interested in that final question, and, and I've um, been watching a little bit on the Twitter feed as well, that, you know, the, what a, jumps to my mind is that, um, you know, with 31 guidelines, that's kind of how Sean opened our, Jim opened our um, conversation this evening, how do we know what what is required in order to say yes I'm teaching within the UDL framework it just seems so challenging to kind of limit that and what are some steps that we could as a community agree to focus on to, to um, help our teachers think about you know some some minimal standards in order to say yes I, I am using the UDL framework in my instruction I think I, I'll address that um, by saying that one of the things to remember is that we're looking at reducing barriers. So if you're looking at doing an intervention and you can identify what the barriers are for different students, for any students, and, and you apply some checkpoints related to those barriers, that's a good start. So I think we also want to balance being too prescriptive about how many of something there are and also look at the issue of the, re the reduction of barriers as where we start when we're assessing what we're, how we're going to apply the 31 checkpoints. And often, on a practical level, again, when I'm teaching my teacher preparation courses and my students are learning how to make a lesson plan, I tell them to fi find the barriers that are in something they're planning to do and try to apply, I usually say two or three when they're in their first semester, and then they can they start to see that once you do a few of those, apply a few of those checkpoints, it's not that hard to hit five or six. So again, I don't, um, as far as I see it in practice, I think teachers can usually handle about three, four, five, six when they're making a lesson plan. But I think the key, again, becomes identifying the barriers and then deciding how many checkpoints to use. You know, you know, in relationship to that, uh, Louis Lord Nelson offered this idea, is anyone looking at the lesson environment design as well as implementation? And I think that almost combines a couple of things we just mentioned there. And Louis shared that she stresses the former just as much as she stresses the latter in terms of the design of the lesson as well as the implementation. So that's an interesting consideration. You know, and, and Sean, I, I wonder sometimes if we just should try to get some degree of starting consensus from the field to set some benchmarks to say that, um, you know, we, we want to strive to be able to have any, any study that is 
thinking of UDL as an intervention that, that they have to be able to document, uh, say, a minimum of two checkpoints from each of the three principles, for example, or, or maybe three checkpoints from, from each of the three. And, and just kind of uh, set that as some standard, it's going to shift because we may see that, um, it, you know, if we have nine and three, three and three, and we see amazing effects, well, that would be something wonderful to see. But just as if we had three, three and three, and we see no real effects, we can't sur turn around and say that, ah, UDL now is not working because again it's finding that combination of things which which we don't really know yet which is this optimal or magical combination we may never see that Jim I'm gonna jump in and I'm gonna take us a little I you know we've had conversations about that I wanna go back to what Louis Lord Nelson just posted about is anyone looking at both well, that's actually what we're doing in our study now, Louie, and she's exactly right. If you, if you research um, the literature, you can find studies on UDL lesson planning. You can find that. They're pretty dry in terms of we did an intervention with, with um, teacher candidates and their lesson planning changed. There's a few of those. But there are very, very, and few I use, you know, there, there's a few of all of this, quite frankly. So we're, we're really looking at minute numbers and when, we're, when we're talking about any published research on application of the UDL framework. But none of them look at Jim's point, which is, is there some sort of magical number or, or weight of, um, of components before you actually say yes this is universal design um, for learning and in implementation and planning and then comparing that to actual teaching practice you know correlating those planning those plans to actual practice there it, there's a, nothing really nothing that's in, incredible so um, or that I've found. So feel free to email me that if, if I'm dissing you and you have fan five or ten studies on this and, and I just haven't seen them. Um, but, you know, we have to be better, I think, as a field at showing how this works and what the it actually is. You know, we act like there's great consensus on what universal design for learning, on what the framework actually is. And when you get a little bit outside of a group that really plays in this pool, there's a lot of gray, murky area on on what that means. So Lisa, uh, one of the comments on the Hangout is we have two uh, editors, uh, two special journals uh, on the Hangout, you and Jim. And really? Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, from your perspective in terms of getting the word out, getting some of these things published, are there yeah. ideas? But unfortunately, I mean, it's such a buzzword. Everyone throws it in their manuscript, but as was stated earlier, it's in the intro, it's it's talked about a little bit there, and then when it comes down to methods and implementation, you don't see it. So if you're asking me, is Focus getting a lot of manuscripts that, you know, that really look at universal design for learning in kids with ASD or even kids with intellectual disabilities, the answer is no. Okay. We don't and, have them. And I can add, um, when I was editor of JSET, we had we had a few manuscripts come in on on UDL that that were very well written and and they had some intriguing results but uniformly the reviewers said um, in these particular cases uh, th there was there was not evidence provided one to ensure that there was fidelity of the implementation and when it came defining to UDL, it was once again just some loose terms thrown out that this was done, kind of this was done, and that was done. And, and it was a challenge uh, report, get, having a methodology section that convinced the reviewers that something was done systematically and, and with fidelity. Well, I also wonder, if I can interrupt for just a second, you know, Patty offers on the Hangout, uh, a method where she's interviewed her students and how powerful it is for students to talk about the work 
and how it's helped her and others to be dynamic teachers. But I'm wondering that methodology, and I'm wondering right. that element, you know, of, of that that tends not to, you know, whether or not that would be um, should that be something from a publisher standpoint, folks? We should be uh, telling the field to share to to speak uh, in terms of submissions. Well, I think in terms of submissions, one of the things I saw Jamie's tweet because I'm going back and forth. One of the things that he asked for is tips, and yeah. I think if we want to advance the field, one of the things that we have to do is is just like you would with an intervention, we have to justify the application of UDL as a framework. We have to talk about it in terms of um, how it is actually being applied throughout the research, how it's being measured, and we can't throw it in as a catchphrase at the very beginning and then leave it along until we come back to conclusions. Um, the other thing, as I said earlier, is we've got to do a better job of, of actually talking about what, what methodology we're using, what components we're using, and who the participants are. We don't we just don't have that in terms of my population, for sure. Um, so those are my tips. Well, Don's offering potentially to trying to make UDL interventions, uh, trying to make UDL an intervention maybe too much of a white whale, and wondering rather is it an intervention that we need to incorporate uh, several of the UDL checkpoints into what we do, and maybe that's another. But then again, it sounds like people are trying to do that in face value, um, Elisa, but not sort of following through in terms of the actual research design. Well, I actually like Don's comment because I don't refer to UDL as an intervention in my own work. I, I just I think it's a framework. I don't think it's an intervention. Although technically you are changing practice when you're applying frameworks, so you could you could talk about that. <laughs> so Well and then, you know, if if we were thinking if we put on our IES hats, um, they they I mean the language is relate I mean intervention is used um, in, in a lot of contexts, but ultimately if you have stakeholders uh, and you're trying to sell, say, to a big school district that they need to implement UDL and they're going to invest X number of dollars, um, th they're likely going to want to know what's, what's the proof, what's the evidence say. And again, um, I think it makes it both challenging, exciting, and very frustrating is trying to come up with with how do you take something that that I think unequivocally as a framework for the individual checkpoints we have some some really interesting and pretty strong evidence for individual checkpoints works but when you move into a multivariate sort of condition when you have some that might be appropriate given the nature of the content um, and then in other cases, given the nature of the type of activity, other things might need to stand out. It, it becomes very difficult to be able to, um, to put everything together and say uniformly, if you do UDL, we're going to see, uh, we're, we're going to see outcomes. Um, so so I, I just think, I think for those of you who are out there, if you have a few extra million dollars, I think all of us would love to put together some additional uh, research studies. With well, I wonder if Linda is also offering potentially, yeah. I understand, Linda, uh, that maybe it's the right checkpoint. Instead of potentially a number of checkpoints, maybe it's centering yeah. on and trying to implement that. Uh, yeah, I, you know, Sean, which is, in, and I don't want to talk too much, but, you know, again, we're talking about what sort of protocols we, we could have. Uh, adopt. You know, maybe what we need to do, or would I think interesting to me, is take take Hattie's work and some of the others and go through, find those checkpoints that have the strongest effect size and and choose a certain number of those. Because if we already see that we have evidence of strong effects, we would like to presume that if you start implementing multiple of the multiple practices like that that would spill over and we might see a, a, a stronger opportunity for a larger overall effect. Thanks for sharing on the, uh, the, uh, on the keep tweeting folks these are great ideas I hope I've represented them back to the, uh, the group in terms of what we're sharing. Sean, you're doing a great job moderating that Twitter feed. Thank you. 
I was just going to add to what Jim said. I think one of the complications is that at the very core of universal design for learning is flexibility. And so when you start trying to put something that at its very core has to be flexible and you try to put that in a box, it, it, it's awkward and it doesn't fit well in that box. And so we've struggled. I know that at least those of us who are on the research panel for UDLIRN, we've had this conversation. It's like a, a, a replay. Every year we have this conversation about what has to be in the box. And I, you know, I think a really large scale study about what, what are the, or do we even want to go there? I mean, those are the questions. Do we want to know what has to be um, implemented in terms of those 31 components and what are the things we can be flexible about? Or or is there some magic? I mean, that is the question at hand always in our group is how do you measure it with and maintain flexibility? Well, you know, and, and it's interesting to piggyback on that, Elisa. You know, Don offers the fact with this Wild West, do we need to offer some structure through a journal of UDL? And then uh, Sue and Jamie are offering ideas of maybe, you know, do we, do we partner in this implementing researchers? And Jamie is saying, do we need along those lines some you know publication standards some quality indicators uh, that go along some of these efforts and, and I'd ask I had, I'll, I'll answer those at least my opinion is yes 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 <laughs> yeah I mean well if you remember when the UDL IRN first started and we had our first leadership meeting a lot of it was around um, creating a UDL design journal so something that would actually have that format that people could explore and you know it's just one of those things that it, we keep talking about and yet <laughs> what's Jamie's tweet now I want to see <laughs> where is that journal Jamie <laughs> yeah well at you know I, and then I want to get back to something that um, Kavita and and Min shared earlier and and I've seen uh, I've certainly had had similar uh, statements made w when I teach UDL is when you look at a beginning teacher um, 31 checkpoints is absolutely overwhelming to, to, to those teachers and getting them to focus on five or six I think in some cases is a, a challenge so uh, even this notion of, of scaling up UDL uh, is is also a, a research issue in our field because and I think um, CAS and using Fixins model I think has pointed out that to scale up and really implement UDL uh, across a school district is is going to take years. It's not something that necessarily is going to happen overnight, and and that's a whole nother set of issues with regards to the research of, of the fidelity of implementation either in one individual's classroom uh, at, from a individual stakeholder teachers perspective to uh, thinking on a district level wanting to have UDL be uh, that that significant framework that's going to yield uh, more favorable student outcomes I like Louie's um, comment just now on Twitter about um, sitting and, and interviewing teachers on why they choose specific components, how they make that decision, and those are the types of things we need to get out into the field. You know, those are the types of studies we need to be doing so that then we could create some sort of, if we do need to create some sort of measurement device, we need to do it where it honors the flexibility of universal design for learning. But that that's perfect. We just need to move it from our professional development experience or our work with teachers and move it actually into print. So yeah, and just shared uh, a, a publication to submit to. What's, what's that publication again, Lisa? Huh? Huh? Never mind. I muted. Sorry. What did you say? Publication to submit it to? The UDL IRN Journal. Oh, always, always, uh, <laughs> Since yeah. 2008, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Min and, and Kavita, you've been, we want to give you a chance to, to step back in. The, the three of us, we, we talk way too much sometimes, I think. So uh, the, the floor is back on you. What are some reflections that that you're 
you're having on on our discussion right now? Well, definitely in, in the paper that we have published, uh, we did talk about the fact that this, the field needs to establish standards, as and this is the discussion going on with the UDL IRN. Um, I think also doing some work with CAS and kind of seeing, I agree with Elisa that flexibility and choice is such a key part of UDL that I think we need to keep that as part of anything we do when we start looking at operationalizing it in the research. And um, I... One of the things that my, some of my colleagues and I are looking at is also taking things that are already practices that we know that may not be connected to UDL but that we know are effective and applying UDL to those practices. So UDL is a framework and it becomes a framework to make practices that we know work more flexible and more barrier free. So that is another direction of research to look at things that we already know has a great research base behind it. We know it works for students receiving special ed services but those practices still sometimes have barriers that can be taken away by applying the checkpoints and so that's another thing to look at do um, how can we apply UDL and again take a look at it um, kind of do a kind of do an, an assessment of that practice and see where the barriers might be for some learners apply UDL and then see how that works once you make it more flexible with more choices thank you for that giving us that floor <laughs> <laughs> that's great to meet you. So I'm looking at the time now, and we are at 9.01, so we are coming to the end of our Hangout for the evening. I'm going to pass it to Sean, though, to um, do some final wrap-up from the Twitter feed and then um, give everybody a chance for one final comment for this evening. Well, my interruptions have actually been from the Twitter feed, so I think that I, I hope I've represented what uh, folks have shared, and uh, it clearly seems to be that there's uh, a lot of energy out there, there's some folks out there doing that I think from an IRM perspective we might look to further collaborate to help in better understanding and a lot of what's been talked about the last few minutes I think is representative of some of the solutions being offered on the Twitter feed. So again my interruptions have been probably what's been there. Wonderful, thank you. And I, we do have one last question. Um, if there's anybody interested in talking more to the research committee, is there someone oh. they connecting Go with? to the next slide. Go to the next slide. Go to the next slide. Thank you, Elisa. All right. So or the last slide. I the should last say. slide. Okay, here we go. There it is. So Jim, myself, and Sean are all on the research committee for the UDL IRN. Please reach out to us, folks. We'd really love to get a, 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 a We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to get some uh, energy and synergy around a lot of efforts that are already ongoing. Perfect. And then from our presenters this evening, would you like to make any closing comments? Lisa, we'll start with you. Uh, do research and write it up and submit it. <laughs> That's what I'll say. Okay. And Jim, how about you? I, I would say for those of you who um, were, were uh, participating in tonight's Hangout and you are classroom teachers, I think we would love, we would be excited if, if you might be willing to open up your classroom or advocate on any of us here uh, on behalf of the possibility of, of coming in and, and trying to expand the research base on UDL by, by doing some classroom based research. I think all of us would much rather see more of that rather than the synthesis opinion pieces that uh, we alluded at that seem to be the bulk of the literature on, on UDL right now. Thank you. And Kavita and Min, any last comments before we close tonight? Um, no, thank you. I think we've had our... Uh, uh, Lisa gave us a chance to speak, so I think we're, we're good. Thank you. All right. Well, I'll say the last, final words then and just thank everybody, especially our um, presenters this evening, Jim and Elisa and Min, Kavita and Sean. We really appreciate you sharing your expertise with us this evening. Um, it is a difficult area to tackle, but I think if anyone can um, get to the bottom of it, it's this group. So I have confidence in all of you. And thank you again for all of your uh, resources and sharing and your offers for continued collaboration. And for those of you who joined us online and in the Hangout, um, thank you for your time and your 
participation. It really was a wonderful. I was uh, able to follow actually both the uh, Hangout and the Twitter feed. It's been a, a fascinating conversation. Let's continue it. Um, our committee will be posting a monthly Hangout, so this is not our last opportunity to gather and to share. So I look forward to seeing you all in November, and make sure you get registered for the summit. We'd love to see you in March in Baltimore. Thanks, everybody, and have a great evening. Thank you. Bye.